Thanks everybody for joining us this morning for our hydropower coffee hour. Um, I'll give a little uh, sort of setup for how we were going to plan to do this this morning. Um, and um, basically say welcome to everyone and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we have tagged a few of our uh, knowledgeable stakeholder friends who have been working on the relicensing with us. Sorry, multitasking with my son. Um, to introduce themselves uh, and be able to be here to answer questions and then also introduce one of the critters that, uh, you know, were considered during this dam relicensing that have the potential to be impacted by the uh, activities of the hydro facility. Um, so we'll do that as quickly as we can. The idea was to just take about 10 minutes to sort of introduce these, these critters. And I have a little slideshow that I'll share so that we can put eyes on what they look like. We'll go through that and then we'll hope to have a, a big chunk of time to be able to um, answer questions. So let me go ahead and share this slideshow now. So hydropower coffee are critters. Can everyone see my screen? I got yep. some nods, great. Okay, and uh, I'll kick it off by introducing myself. I am uh, Kathy Erfer. So I'm river steward up in Vermont, New Hampshire and uh, focus primarily on the relicensing right now of the uh, wilder Bellows Falls and Vernon dams, in addition to a lot of the all smaller run of river dams in the watershed up this way. And so my job for right now, in, in addition to introducing myself, is to introduce you to the Fowler's toad. And that's the Fowleri, Fowleri. So that's the critter up in the top of the screen there you see. Um, this critter is endangered in Vermont and uh, considered a species of special concern in New Hampshire. And uh, the, it's, this is the northern range of its habitat kind of in the country. It likes to live in an area where it has access to a stable pool, a stable water, and also unvegetated sort of sandy um, shorelands because it needs to dig in and burrow, create burrows for estivation and hibernation. And so it also does not want those two things to be far apart from each other. So it needs the pool for breeding and the ability to sort of have access to that sandy area. And so, um, and it, one of the interesting things about it is its call is a long sort of sounds like a sheep bleeding for about one or four seconds. Um, and the habitat can be uh, affected by different surface water fluctuations. So you could imagine if it had a pool that went dry, that's gonna be a problem for its breeding because it lay lays its eggs in the pool. Um, so it needs to have that stable water level. The habitat may benefit from periodic shoreline disturbance. So the idea being that sometimes if there's floods that come in and scour it, that helps to create habitat for this critter. And, um, the one population that is in our area, the one confirmed population, uh, there's, there were about four or five different potential sightings of this creature over the past you know, 30 years along the Connecticut River, but the one confirmed population is actually in an area that could be affected by both the Vernon Dam and the Northfield Mountain Pump Storage Facility. So I'll pass it on to Andrea. All right, um, I'm going to go over damselflies and dragonflies, which are collectively referred to as odonates. Um, these creatures are most easily recognized by their, um, hold on, let me just unspotlight you, Kathy. <laughs> or, or if you wanna just undo it <laughs> while I'm talking, can you do that? Um, hold on. I think I can, I pinned everybody to the top, Andrea. So just go ahead. I think you're fine. I think everybody. Can all right. See. All I can see is you. So oh. just change your view to gallery. Oh, okay. To yeah. That's fine. 
Um, all right. So these creatures are most easily recognized by their beautiful adult stage, but they do spend most of their life cycle in rivers or ponds as aquatic larvae. They grow for a year or more in the water and then the larvae are ready to turn into adults. They crawl up the riverbank between mid-May and mid-August and then the adult form exits from the larval exoskeleton in a process called eclosure. After eclosure, the insect needs to dry and harden before taking flight. Odonates are unable to move um, until the drying process is complete. And this is a particularly vulnerable part of their life cycle. They can easily be snatched up as food by predators during this time, but they can also be washed back into the water by rising water levels or boat wakes or waves. And when that happens, they die. State listed odonates were found all over the study areas for the Great River Hydro and First Light facilities. Um, no federally endangered species are present, but state listed species are. Both companies looked at the distance each species crawls up the bank and the time it takes for eclosure to happen and they performed a risk assessment of sorts on their operations, both upstream and downstream of the dams. The two companies have proposed slightly different approaches to reducing project impacts to Odinates. And that is my little summary. Next up is what, Kathy? Tiger beetles. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Kennedy. I'm a river scientist with the Nature Conservancy. I'm not a tiger beetle expert, but I'm going to be telling you about these little voracious micropredators that, um, in this case, inhabit the riparian area, that area, the sand and cobble bars along the river. There's two species that um, we are of primary interest along the Connecticut, the Puritan tiger beetle that lives on sandbars, specifically um, in a very uh, narrow range on the Connecticut River, and then the um, cobblestone tiger beetle that lives in cobble bars um, more in the northern sections of the river and its tributaries. And um, so these animals, although they are um, adapted to some disturbance like um, ice flows in the winter and high flows in the spring and um, high flows from storms in the summer, they require, or they're likely require really long periods without disturbance so that they can live and reproduce and eat um, and survive. And so what we're looking for from hydropower operations are periods where they have this opportunity and um, operations that don't inundate their habitat um, too frequently. Because in that case, um, it kind of tires them out and they're not able to reproduce and um, eat as much as um, they could otherwise. And so um, they're, when they have too much inundation, they're not able um, in some cases to grow and survive. So um, let's see, I mean, that's my minute, right? <laughs> um, and then I think also one other thing to know is that they are, um, the larvae are dormant in the winter, so um, they're likely able to withstand longer periods of inundation or from uh, disturbance from ice flows. And then after they breed, the adults die. So they have a very interesting life cycle. Um, and I think next is tessellated darters and mussels. Uh, I'm on for the muscle, but I am not, I had not prepared anything for the darter. Oh. Did somebody else have that critter? <laughs> no, no, go for the muscle. Okay. You could just explain the relationship to the darter. I do it. explain it, so. sure. Okay. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Grader. I'm a fish and wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm going to um, give you a brief overview of a special freshwater mussel, the dwarf wedge mussel. Um, it's a federally endangered and it's 
one of the smaller muscles. And Mark Ferguson is on the call. He is a dwarf wedge muscle expert. So please, Mark, weigh in if I've misrepresented every anything. And if there's any other interesting tidbits you think should be shared with the group. Um, it's a very small muscle, only reaching like a maximum length of about two inches. Uh, in the late summer, the males release gametes that the females collect as they are siphoning for food. And they will then brood these fertilized eggs over the winter. And by the spring, they've transformed into a life stage called glycidia, which actually look like very tiny clams. And then in the spring, the moms release these glycidia and they attach to the fins of host fish, such as tessellated darter and slimy sculpin. And during attachment, they'll uh, transform to juvenile mussels and then drop off the fish and settle into the substrate. Uh, mussels generally don't move large distances except uh, when they're mobilized by high flow events. The dwarf wedge mussel is one of the more sedentary freshwater mussels, putting it at higher risk of um, uh, potentially at higher risk or of uh, effects of flow fluctuations. Um, as they could cause stranding uh, if the river flows drop suddenly. And this stranding could lead to desiccation or drying out um, or predation. And even if it survives these periodic strandings, it can't feed during that time. And so its growth will be impacted. And that's my little blurb about the dwarf wedge mussel. So we're to critters and then back to Melissa for sturgeon. Is this me? <laughs> no, Melissa was gonna do sturgeon. Oh, I'm sorry, it's me again. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Melissa again here. <laughs> this time I'm gonna tell you about short-nosed sturgeon. This is another federally endangered species. Um, sturgeon are an anadromous species like Atlantic salmon and American shad, meaning that they spend a portion of their life in the um, marine environment and a portion in the freshwater environment. So um, in the Connecticut River watershed, they range from Long Island Sound as far upstream as Turner's Falls Dam, uh, though there is an ongoing research effort to determine if there are any sturgeon that exist upstream of Turner's Falls Dam. Uh, sexually mature adults move to distinct spawning areas in the early spring. After spawning, the adults move quickly back downstream to rest and feed. Uh, and how far downstream they move can vary. Sometimes, if they have access, they'll move all the way down to the estuary because uh, that probably has uh, more feeding and resting opportunities for them. Um, but in the Connecticut River, uh, there is there historically was an impediment for them moving downstream, and therefore uh, they had become landlocked. So a portion of them only moved in river. They didn't move all the way down to the estuary. Um, the eggs that were spawned hatch into larvae called fry, and those fry also drift off the spawning beds um, to rear in the river. Um, it takes males about five to seven years and females six to 12 years to reach maturity. And their typical lifespan in the Connecticut River is around 30 years. On the Connecticut River, uh, the concerns with hydro operations um, relate to flow management. Again, uh, we want to make sure there's sufficient flow to protect the spawning sites. That's quite critical. And also there are potential impacts to early life stages, those fry, because fry um, are not strong swimmers and they are small. So they're prone to uh, being it, eaten by other critters and the margins of this river which is where they like to be, the littoral zone, um, are what gets dewatered um, first and most quickly um, under a flow fluctuation scenario, hydropower induced. And so they are uh, at risk of um, being impacted by those fluctuations. Um, 
I think that's all I have to say about sturgeon. Awesome, thanks, Melissa. And then on to Bill. Hi, good morning. I'm Bill McDavid. I'm a contractor with NOAA Fisheries and uh, I'm involved with the relicensing of Turner's Falls and Northfield Mountain. As far as um, uh, American Shad go, uh, it's one of the strongest runs that we have in, uh, in, in New England on the Connecticut River. Uh, the Holyoke uh, Fishway passes roughly in the range of uh, 300,000 to 500,000 shad. So it's, it's, it's a very strong run. And uh, the adult females and males are migrating upstream from, from the, they've transitioned from the saltwater ocean into the estuary. Uh, they're swimming upstream uh, to Holyoke where they've transitioned to a, a freshwater environment. And then they uh, continue upstream where they uh, are past the Turner's Falls project. And that's where uh, my colleague, Melissa and I, and uh, um, others are, are very involved with the relicensing there uh, in an effort to improve fish passage for uh, American shad. And as a re result of relicensing, we anticipate uh, improved flows and uh, improved fit means of fish passage. So we're, we're, we're optimistic that we'll, we'll see uh, improved runs of American shad at the Turner's Falls project. And I see that Lael is on this call. And uh, the nice thing about improved runs or anticipated uh, improved runs of shad is that uh, Vermont and New Hampshire should see more American shad arriving at, at, at the Vernon project. Um, and then uh, these uh, American shad, uh, the, uh, they spawn generally in the main stem Connecticut River and some tributaries, but the, the bulk of the, the population is, is in the main stem. And uh, once the, 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 the young of the year are born and the little juveniles, they do some rearing in, in the freshwater environment. And then the, the juveniles turn around uh, in the summer and sometimes into the fall that their downstream migration starts. And a lot of these juveniles have to get past the, those same hydroelectric facilities that, that, that the parents passed. So the, the small juveniles, uh, so there too, uh, as a result of relicensing, uh, we're anticipating improved uh, survivability or less mortality. Uh, so we, we anticipate that more of the juveniles will uh, make it alive past the hydroelectric facilities. And there's actually something called the uh, repeat spawners, uh, which is where the Females, uh, some females, the percentages vary kind of around 15%, sometimes more, sometimes less, but some percent of these females do turn around and, uh, and, and make their migration out towards the sea as well. So along with the juveniles heading, uh, heading downstream, uh, the females head downstream. And, and this, is, this is where high uh, survivability at each of these hydroelectric facilities is, is important. So that, that's something that, that the resource agencies are, are focusing on. And then switching over to, uh, well, collectively river herring, uh, that's the umbrella term really for, for two species. And under that umbrella for river herring, uh, there are alewife and there are blueback herring. And they look uh, very similar. Uh, there are some differences in, in the eye, uh, eye size, um, but it, 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 it just at, at, at first glance, it's a little difficult. If you don't have much time or good visibility, it's not really that easy to, tell the, the, the difference apart. Um, but uh, the species are, are like shad, they're anadromous, so it's the same general uh, life history and, and life strategy whereby they, they, the adults go upstream and spawn and just like shad, the, the juveniles head downstream. Uh, the difference, the main difference between blueback herring and alewife is where they spawn. Alewife tend to like uh, lakes and, and slow moving water whereas blueback herring tend, tend to spawn in, uh, in the main stem river where there's just a, a little bit of velocity. And so as far as alewife go, uh, alewife, well, I don't know if anyone from Connecticut DEEP -E is on, but th there's some pretty good alewife runs kind of in the little tributaries to the, and, and smaller rivers to the east and the west of the Connecticut River. But there really isn't a terribly strong alewife run um, and certainly, we, we, we generally just don't see alewife north of the uh, Massachusetts border for the, the adults that are heading upstream. Uh, Steve Gephardt from Connecticut DEP sort of joked um, that uh, alewife are handed the memo when they enter the Connecticut River and it says, don't, don't swim into Massachusetts. So, you know, once in a while we might see some, but it's, it's a very low percent of the population of alewife that make it to, to the Holyoke Project in Massachusetts. Uh, blueback is a different story. 
it's actually it's a little bit of a sad story in so much as uh, the Holyoke Fishway, you know, the first dam on the river, um, used to pass north of 600,000 fish, uh, blueback. There was this huge, um, huge number of alewife, or pardon me, blueback were passed at Holyoke in the 80s and turned them into the 90s. And then we just saw this rather dramatic decrease. And the blueback herring run at Holyoke has been really depressed for 20, 25 years now. Um, and the, the number of blueback we see at Holyoke is kind of in the, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 range. We did have a good run or a good year in 2019. We saw a little over 5,000, but it's, it's really, it's, it's a small fraction of what, what we used to see in those, the, the, the big years, the big returns in the 90s. Um, but uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to make some efforts to improve uh, access to blueback uh, habitat on some of the lower tributaries, to the Connecticut River down in Connecticut, um, the Farmington River is, uh, comes to mind. Um, so there, there are some, some restoration efforts there. Uh, Melissa and I have a colleague, uh, Ken Sprankel with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who's done a lot of um, great science and data collection on uh, blueback herring, doing some age, uh, looking at the age of the fish um, and trying to get some estimates on the population and all that sample. And he does a bunch of sampling downstream of Holyoke. So there's some good science and some good information coming out of those efforts. Um, I think with that, I will wrap it up. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. And on to Lael. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Lael Will. I'm a fisheries biologist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and I have been graciously involved with the relicensing uh, since the beginning back in 2012. Uh, so been there every step of the way. Uh, also responsible for <clears throat> monitoring uh, these diagramous species as they move through the projects of Vernon, Bellows Falls, and Wilder at the fish ladders. Um, our department has been responsible for monitoring those fish ladders since they were operational in the mid 80s. Um, so I'm going to tackle each species separately. Uh, the first one, sea lamprey, is one of the more primitive fish species. Um, it is native to the Connecticut River. A lot of people uh, you know, associate the species with the sort of nuisance population over in Champlain, but they are indeed native to the Connecticut River. Um, they're also a species of greatest conservation need in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, so for the relicensing, you know, what we focused on for these guys is, um, you know, they come into the, come into freshwater, in the springtime, they'll they'll migrate to their spawning grounds, spawn, and then die. So what we wanted to do was to make sure, number one, that they are adequately provided with fish passage so that they can move to their spawning grounds. And then we wanted to protect that spawning habitat. And the way that we focused on that was through flows. So if you can imagine, you know, with the hydros, if if there's rapid flow fluctuations, there's the potential to dewater their nests. Um, they build a nest when they spawn, um, and so that nest could potentially get dewatered during these water level fluctuations, which will um, cause mortality. Um, and then there's also sort of the behavioral aspects of it. If, if a fish is trying to spawn and the water is, you know, moving up and down, they may be impacted behaviorally by um, moving to a less desirable um, spawning location. So that's what we focused on for the relicensing was, you know, improving fish passage and flows for this species. Um, they did do some studies and, you know, they do pass around the time when shad pass. They will go up to um, the Wilder Dam and they will spawn as far up um, as the White River. So, you know, with having these ladders be operational during their spawning period um, and also investigating how effective these fish ladders are at passing them has been the focus. Um, for American eel, they have sort of a different life cycle um, where they actually spawn in the ocean um, and rear in the fresh water. So similar to uh, <clears throat> sea lamprey, they're gonna need to use these fish ladders uh, effectively to be able to move upstream into their rearing habitat. They will typically go, they'll either stay in the main stem or they'll go into the tributaries, into ponds and lakes. 
um, to rear where they'll feed off fish and other uh, critters. And then um, after some time, they will then um, turn into a silver eel and migrate back down to the ocean to spawn in the Sargasso Sea, which is near the Bahamas. So one of the trickier things with the American eel as opposed to sea lamprey is getting them back out to the ocean safely, given that a lot of uh, the eel that we see in the upper headwaters tend to be these large fecund, meaning they have a lot of eggs in them, uh, females. So if you can imagine them moving through the turbines, there's a lot of uh, injury that can be incurred um, as well as mortality. So that was one of the things that was investigated during the relicensing was number one, when are they moving? Um, how are they moving? Are they getting entrained and impinged and moving through the turbines and what sort of injury rates are they incurring as they move downstream? So one of the major focuses for the eel is number one, getting them upstream effectively, but also getting them back downstream um, without having that, that injury and mortality, especially if you look at, you know, moving through multiple projects um, and look and focusing on that cumulative impacts of those, those injuries and, and mortality can have a big impact on the population, at least the Connecticut River run. <clears throat> awesome, thank you so That's much it. to all of you. And um, I will stop sharing my screen now so we can actually have this be more of a discussion and hear from uh, you know, other folks. If you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. You could also uh, just you know, unmute and ask if uh, I think we're a small enough group, we can probably manage that. There is a question that came in early on that was what it, what, what are the major fisheries issues that could be improved? I suspect it's with downstream passage for migrating fish. Not sure if this question has sort of been answered, but um, does anyone want to take a stab at it? Uh, Lael, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so for the, the fish ladders, and, and I'm just going to speak for Vermont, you know, they were originally designed, Vernon was originally designed for salmon, um, and, and as well as shad, some modifications were made for shad, um, and downstream passage really focused on Atlantic salmon as well. So as folks may know, the Atlantic salmon program um, ended in 2013, and so now what we're trying to do is focus on these other species. Um, in particular at Vernon, we wanna make sure that those adult shad can get downstream safely, um, as well as the eel, as I mentioned, you know, given their long body size, uh, incur a lot of injury and mortality. So that is a priority for us to work with the hydro to come up with a plan and a time frame, and come up with a design that's going to work for those species and then follow up with um, testing of that to make sure that that design is going to work. And then there'll be some follow up monitoring to that as well. Um, and same thing for, for Bellows Falls and Wilder, their downstream was primarily focused on the Atlantic salmon. So when you're dealing with different species, you have to modify depending on their swimming behavior, the timing, so on and so forth. In addition, Lael, I would just add for beyond just fish passage, um, other potential improvements that we could see um, are uh, mm, changes to both the um, impoundment management and uh, below tail race management because uh, fluctuating impoundments, again, can impact um, spawning nests, right, of those um, species that construct nests, which might be upgradient and then potentially are dewatered under a, a low pool. And so um, trying to, to reduce that fluctuation could be an improvement for those species. And that would include smallmouth bass and sunfish, Leo. Yeah, so um, for the impoundment species that was, you know, managing that, that flow regime to reduce the, the flow fluctuations the impoundment fluctuations in the spring springtime for all the species that spawn. So we have, you know, uh, northern pike, 
um, walleye tend to be more in the tributaries, um, but your, your centrarchids, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, um, yellow perch was one that we get a lot of complaints from the anglers because they will spawn um, in the setbacks on, and once they spawn and that water level drops, those eggs get dewatered. So yellow perch was a big one as well. And then downstream, similarly, if there are these flow fluctuations, um, there are similar impacts that could happen, um, again, to the early life stages, those fry that are hanging along the littoral margins that then get shifted towards uh, the, the main portion of the river where they might uh, be more likely to interact with those larger um, species that like to eat them, um, as an example. And uh, the other thing is there could be these kind of indirect effects where, for an example, with the dwarf wedge mussel, uh, those flow fluctuations could be impacting the tessellated darter, which, you know, are a small benthic species. It doesn't tend to move a lot, and it also tends to um, inhabit at least seasonally, um, you know, the margins also. So if you're putting that, moving that species, um, because of fluctuating flows, it's putting it potentially out of proximity to those dwarf wedge. And therefore, if it's not there when the um, dwarf wedge are releasing their glycidia, then you know, you're know you gonna have uh, less recruitment to that next, they're not gonna be able to metamorphose <laughs> and settle as juveniles. So there are those kind of indirect impacts too because of how these all these critters interrelate in, in the ecosystem. Right, and I think for the, the larval fish, it is getting you know displaced into less suitable habitat, not having the food resources available for them, you know, in that less suitable habitat as well as predation. <clears throat> so we have another question from Kyle, um, who says, "I've noticed in the past year or two that water levels here upstream of Wilder fluctuate daily to the point that other migratory species, in this case shorebirds, do not have time to find exposed flats and feed. Is anything going to change to prolong low water above the dam, or are daily fluctuations now the norm?" Um, Katie, you want to answer that? Sure. Um, so we hope that daily fluctuations are going to decrease. We had um, several of us on this call had a, a long series of conversations with the hydro operator up there to come up with the alternative to their current operations. Um, and they, and that proposal um, was put into their license application. And that will include, if that, if that, goes through if FERC accepts that, that will include um, stabilizing that um, reservoir level. However, um, that that reservoir level will be higher or will be stable at the upper level to allow the company to um, have more head, as it were, behind the dam to produce um, electricity. Um, however, that we, so those, those needs along the river um, of the riparian species that we we're talking about are it's similar for um, other species that depend on on that interface between land and water. So we're hoping that that stability will will help other species as well. That said, you're talking about upstream of wilder, and um, we were focused on wilder and Bellows Falls and Vernon, the two projects wilder and the two projects below there. So the upstream projects, um, 15 mile falls, they will still fluctuate daily. Um, so hopefully that the stabilization of the wilder reservoir will, will primarily benefit um, closer to the, to the dam, but further, further upstream um, of the impoundment, you'll still have some fluctuations due to the continued operations of 15 mile falls. Um, anybody have anything to add to that? Um, I have something that was sort of, you know, when when Lyle was talking about fish passage and the fish ladders and, uh, you know, she's having been managing essentially these fish ladders since the 1980s, I just wanted to point out that the reason the fish ladders exist is because of the last relicensing of these facilities. So that was one of the results that came out of that relicensing. And this is our chance <laughs> for the next 40 to 50 years for these five facilities to get the next big, you know, 
push of what can be done to protect our species in the river. And so that will include in, in what everyone here is you know, advocating for is in improvements to the fish ladders, stabilization of the flows, um, you know, more water in the bypass reaches of the river, all of these things to help support all of the various different, different critters in the river. And all of the critters that we, you know, introduced, uh, there were studies by both Great River Hydro and First Light to try to look at the impacts of the hydroelectric projects. And now we're trying to come up with the um, suggestions for how they would operate to reduce those impacts. And so, um, you know, we've been hosting these coffee hours just to help educate folks because this is a public process and it's really important that people comment in this process when we have the opportunity, hopefully later in the summer. And I think just to add to that, Kathy, the, the, other, the other point is that, you know, we know that diadromous species and migratory species, you know, make movements for, to complete their life cycle but there's also like resident species that make moving, you know, that need to move as well for rearing and feeding and getting genetic diversity. And there's a lot of benefits for aquatic connectivity in general. So, you know, this round, we did focus um, on resident species as well because they are part of the package and the hydro did agree to operate the fish ladder earlier than normal to accommodate um, walleye and white sucker that are known to make those runs as well. So trying to get out of the realm of just migratory species, it's a whole ecosystem that should be connected. Hell yeah, Lael. <laughs> My one win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, is there a specific improvement for anadromous fish passage that pu the public should be asking for that have been uh, being ignored by first light. So what's the ask for first light for fish passage? So I'll start off with that and maybe Melissa and Bill and Katie can, can help if needed. Um, so just to go over roughly, I don't know how many people who were on the our live stream where we sort of explain what's being proposed and Turner's Falls is kind of a complicated area because there currently is, um, there are two ways to get upstream for migratory fish at the end of the canal at Cabot station, there's a fish ladder. And then um, at the base of the dam, there's another fish ladder and then fish have to uh, go through a gatehouse at the top end of the canal into um, the Turner's Falls impoundment. So First Light is proposing um, to put more water in this, this section of the river that goes around the canal, depending on the season, and that, that's a good thing. Um, they're proposing to, and that will probably bring more fish up to the base of the dam, and they're proposing to put in a fish lift there. Um, and this will probably reduce all the um, wasted time that migratory fish currently spend going through the canal part. So those are probably good things. I think the main thing that, and then downstream, they're going to improve um, survival if you go over the dam by creating a little um, sort of plunge pool area and also protect um, fish from going into the station one, which is a small hydro station off the canal. What they haven't proposed is um, better protection from getting um, killed in the turbines at the end of the canal at Cabot Station. Um, so that's one thing. They are proposing eel passage, which is going to be exciting because there's nothing, there hasn't been anything there ever. Um, so that's a big deal. I'm trying to think what else. I think, you know, what's come up before is um, for upstream passage, the flows coming out of station Cabot, uh, the Cabot station um, are gonna attract fish. And so 
if there's no fish passage there for them, they're proposing to put in this ultrasound system that would repel fish. And um, I think the studies that have been done so far have had some mixed results and, and we've had some on other calls, questions from people asking if there are other health impacts on fish from ultrasound. And I don't actually know, Melissa or Bill, if you know anything more about that, the pros and cons of a system like that. Um, so I think the main thing is better downstream passage at, at Cabot and um, the upstream I think what they propose so far, you know, little details need to be worked out is 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 an improvement, hopefully, from what's there down. Yeah, I would agree with everything you said, Andrea. Um, additional downstream protection at Cabot is is critical, um, particularly with respect to improved survivability of adult American shad because they're. Uh, a large fish and uh, pretty much the relationship is that the larger um, and or longer the fish, the greater the risk of turbine blade strike. Um, and so the higher the potential um, risk of injury and or mortality for those fish that um, are entrained through the, the turbines. So we want to keep as many fish out of the turbines as possible um, and provide them a safe route of passage around the project. Um, and with respect to ultrasound, yes, the, our position is it's uh, an experimental technology. Um, if it is proven to be effective at preventing false attraction to Cabot, that's a good thing. But as Andrea noted, we still need to understand better uh, the potential impacts on non-target species that are also living in the river. So um, it, it may turn out to be used. I have no idea at this point in time. Um, and generally we are supportive of what they've proposed for upstream passage. And we are very hopeful that it will be much more effective than their current um, fish passage facilities. Bill, do you want any add anything? Yeah, let's pick up on the, the Krask Shad Management Plan. Uh, we have a management goal to pass at least 390,000, 397,000 shad at Turner's Falls. Um, that, that's one number that, that I remember. Um, and then the, we have, there was an addendum that uh, several people worked on through 2019 and was adopted in 2020, whereby we, we tell uh, federally licensed facilities that they should be providing 75% uh, upstream passage. So if you had a, a hundred fish, within a, a kilometer of a hydroelectric facility, uh, 75 of those fish should uh, should pass and make it into the head pond. And they should be able to do so uh, within two days. And then uh, you might recall what I was talking about, the, the downstream migration for, for the little juveniles and for those, those repeat spawning females, uh, we have a 95% survival uh, standard. So we, we, the point, the overarching idea is really kill as few animals as possible when, when migrating downstream. And we want those animals to, to be passed uh, within 24 hours. So we have uh, some high survival standards uh, for, for all federally licensed facilities where there are uh, migratory fish. I think, so with uh, Turner's Falls and then the, the products upstream that the shuttle, the Vermont, New Hampshire border, um, there's a little product called Fisk Mill that's uh, on the Ashwala River. Uh, so that there are some other federally li licensed projects where these performance standards will take hold. And uh, we've also done some modeling. Uh, there was a, a, a professor at SUNY Oneonta who basically did a, a full life cycle model. He, he, he crunched <laughs> millions of numbers, but uh, to, to look at, to try to model how these, how shad move through the river throughout their life cycle. And the one kind of take home story from that, that big effort was that it really is important to have a high downstream survival at every one of these facilities uh, because there, there's a cumulative effect. If you're killing, say, if only 60% survive, which is really low, that 60% translates downstream, you're, you're really gonna uh, significantly diminish the population. And so again, the, the, the result of that modeling or the take home message is that we, we really need to have high uh, downstream survival for for these animals. 
Yeah, and I just want to put those the numbers in some context. So <clears throat> I just looked at the la the the I think it was the last fisheries report of the passage for last year. There was about, as Bill said, about three hundred and sixty thousand. Uh, shad that made it to Holyoke, that seems like a lot, but that is nothing compared to what the natural run would have been like before these dams were in the river. We're talking millions, like a healthy population is millions of shad. So that's what hits Holyoke. We had 3,400 shad past Vernon. That is abysmal. And, you know, the, the, all, the obstacle between Holyoke and Vernon is the Turner's Falls Dam and the pump station. There's another question here from David. How do tributary rivers like the Westfield in Massachusetts affect the passage of species in the Connecticut? Uh, I can take a stab at that. Um, typically the, um, the tributaries uh, or the it's assumed that tributary runs are somewhat tributary specific. So these um, some of these species, such as shad and river herring, are queuing to a river, and in salmon queue queue to really their natal spawning site. So they are ex very explicit where they're homing back to. But um, the allocenes like shad and river herring. Um, don't necessarily go back to the exact site um, where uh, their moms and dads um, spawned, but they would go back to that river. And if it's um, based on the scent of the river, and if you're in a tributary and that tributary has a different olfactory um, scent than the main stem river, then they will continue, uh, they will home back to that tributary. And so uh, that wouldn't, if, if that assumption is correct, and genetic analyses, I, I don't believe, but I could be wrong, have yet to be done to corroborate that, um, that, and even if you'd be able to distinguish at that level um, genetically, uh, that it would not take away from the, the main stem um, shad and river herring population. They would be sub, you know, subpopulations off of the entire metapopulation of the river. Does anybody else want to? <laughs> well, I have a question, <laughs> Melissa, to kind of to build on that. And historically, the largest popul you know, the largest population, most fish are going to travel along the the main river because of the size of the river, right? And so that's like that's why the main stem is so important to restore passage on that because it um, it represents the bulk of the population, like a like a highway would more 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 cars are going to travel on a big interstate than on and then smaller. absolutely right and proportionally more habitat and there's all sorts of reasons why you would expect that the main stem would have the largest number of returns uh, um i guess just to pick up on the west yeah uh, uh, everything they said is, is correct as far as maybe the west field specific uh, yeah it's it's a smaller tributary uh there is fish passage there is a ladder at that first dam and to the extent fish get past that first dam, there is some, some spawning and rearing habitat upstream of there. And so there, there is some benefit to, to the population. I mean, it, it, admittedly, it's much smaller than, than the main stem for sure, but uh, some, some shad uh, do sort of take, take that left, if you will, at, at the west field. And, uh, and, and there is a small population there. So it's, um, to the extent that there's available habitat, that, that does help to the overall population. But uh, the Westfield, um, the, the Farmington, the Ashwaelet, th th those are some other tributaries to the Connecticut where, where we know there's there's shad and there is some benefit to the overall population. But in yeah, in the grand scheme of things, the, the, the tributaries obviously they are smaller, and therefore the number of fish in these tributaries are smaller. Um, I, I don't know if Kathy or Andrea, I don't know if you can um, maybe provide a link or somehow with a follow-up uh, provide the, the Krask Shad Management Plan because the point is it, it actually lays out some of the, the tributaries that flow into the main stem and it gives you some idea. It's actually, there's, there's a pretty good summary table in there that kind of gives you the idea about, again, this, or even Katie's idea about the, you know, the interstate, you know, lots of fish on the main stem, but the Krask Shad Management Plan kind of lays out the smaller tributaries and what, what kind of uh, shad populations we, we, we can expect on, on those tributaries that feed into the main stem. 
And Bill, so would you also say that like right now, those tributaries are extremely important because of the poor passage we have, you know, I mean, if you <laughs> we kind of rely on those tributaries to maintain population health because of the passage issues in the river in general? Could yeah, I mean, I, 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 any, oh, um, anytime a, a dam, uh, or you know, it, to the extent we have upstream passage, the idea there is that we're, we're opening up upstream habitat. And so if you've got a dam with no passage um, or po very poor passage, then we just don't get many fish uh, above it. And if you do have good passage, um, or if you do provide a new fishway, then you are opening up new habitat. And that's just a new available habitat uh, for, for these animals to, to, to help the overall population. Yeah, I would chime in just to say that um, I do think tributary populations are really important, even though the numbers are, you know, substantially smaller than the main stem. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons that um, having these kind of um, uh, ancillary um, offshoot populations um, or runs uh, are important include, you know, for that particular sub drainage, um, you know, you're providing um, important uh, trophic interactions, you're providing, you know, eggs and larvae and juveniles, which are a forage base for, you know, other fish in that system. Um, and you're supplementing um, the out, out migrating juveniles, which hopefully will return, you know, as adults um, to keep, help keep the runs going. And, you know, it's critical because the more dispersed you have the, um, the pot, the run B, in a watershed, um, if something happens environmentally um, or anthropogenically, you know, in one part of the system, you don't have to worry about, you know, messing with that entire recruitment year, right? And that could happen if you if you're totally reliant on the west field for your shad run, or the main stem for your shad run, or say the main stem below, you know, Holyoke. Um, so you want to kind of um, bet hedge you know, and get that population as widely distributed um, within suitable habitat as, as possible to, um, to it's a, a risk averse strategy. You're, you know, uh, trying to get the system back as close to as you can to what it was historically. Um, and so we want to try to um, uh, restore as many of those tributary populations um, as possible. I'm just so gonna jump are... in for a sec, because um, we haven't really addressed Northfield Mountain pump storage facility specifically. Um, and uh, First Light did look at the effect of the operations on uh, migrating fish. And I um, pretty sure that the, the main impacts that they found on migrating fish was on downstream migrating juvenile shad and um, downstream migrating eels. So they are, uh, First Light's proposing to put this large net across the tail race um, to prevent fish from getting caught in the works um, and I believe that they're planning on having this installed sort of summer, late summer to fall. Um, they also did a shad egg um, study, assuming that any um, shad eggs that are sort of caught in the whole works would be killed. And there's really not much they can do to kind of prevent those impacts other than not running. Um, and they basically waved away the impacts um, in their studies. <laughs> so I think they did two years of studies. One year showed a larger impact on the number of shad eggs than the other. And they then extrapolated that to the number of adult shad that would have survived and therefore, and they said it was a minimal effect. Um, I think that fish biologists have uh, argued that, that shad eggs have other uh, ecosystem benefits than just eventually becoming 
adult shad. So that was one, one issue. Um, we're kind of out of time, so I should just leave it there and see if there are any other lingering questions. I guess the one last question um, would be the, uh, if somebody can talk about the impact of combined sewer overflows from Springfield, for instance, and what that, the, the impact on migratory species, maybe resident species as well. Um, the questions on what impact do, okay. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question, if there is any. I can make an educated guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, my, I would guess that, that migratory fish would <laughs> get, get as far away as they could from any habitat that, um, that would be, have too much, basically not enough dissolved oxygen. So. I would imagine that the effects would be mostly on the animals that couldn't move and likely they wouldn't be there anymore. So like on the inverts or what, there probably is a depressed invert population, so there's not food. If, if, there, if there really are impacts from combined sewer overflow, that's what I would expect. As a guess though, I don't know for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. For <laughs> I have heard that fish are sometimes attracted to like wastewater treatment plant outfalls. Some of them, I imagine, yeah, it could be. Some stuff coming so, up. Yeah. But I know I um, Springfield has one um, that goes into the Black River. And ironically, the Black River has a great sea lamprey spawning. <laughs> And I believe the dwarf wedge was at the mouth at one point. So they are, you know, feeding their detritivores, feeding off filter, you know. Um, but I think it, you have to look at it cumulatively, you know, maybe a discharge here and there, you know, solution to pollution is dilution. But if everybody's doing it, that's when you're going to hit that threshold for water quality and running into the DO. And, and what ends up happening through time is you just get a lot of species that are resilient to that you know, you, you uh, remove the species that are sensitive to it. So I think that's the big picture. Um, so we are out of time. Thank you so much to uh, Lael, Katie, Melissa, and Bill for being willing to be put on the spot and, and uh, you know, answer questions and introduce some of the other critters that I think, frankly, a lot of people don't know are affected by hydroelectric facilities. Um, and we will follow up with an email to everyone who attended with some links for additional information. We would encourage everyone, we have a, um, we have a hydropower email list that we will add you to that occasionally uh, we are sending updates through, but this is the important one that would actually tell you when the public comment period would open. And uh, I really appreciate Steve's suggestion. We will probably do some sort of little template of comments, suggested comments, general comments that we will share with the public as kind of a starting point. Um, but really FERC needs to hear from the public to understand that there are eyes on this river and that we care and that they had better uh, make sure that what is in this license is strong and protective for our species and our communities. Um, so thanks, anyone, parting words before we leave? Thanks, Katie. Thank you all. Thank you for a great presentation. Thanks for having us, CRC. Yeah, thank you. All right. Take care. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Another awesome job, you guys. Woohoo! Thanks, John. I will probably be trying to reach out to you too in the next week or so for um, trying to work on comment letter from WRC. Um, it has morphed a few times from being multiple letters with specific co-partners to it's now returning to just being one WRC 
letter that other people can sign on to. So I'm going to be trying to work with picking your brains on various parts and um, and trying to generate that in the next couple of weeks. So heads up. Sounds good. <laughs> I'll be a I'm pain gonna... in your posterior in the near future. No, not at all, John. And uh, just so you know, I was going to try to take most of the next week off because the kids are off school. So if I'm unresponsive, that's why. Oh, um, all right. You know, more unresponsive mm -hmm. than I might sometimes usually be. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. Not but. a problem. All righty. All right. Thanks, Thanks y'all. Take care. Have a great day. All right. Anybody hanging on just you to ask too. a lingering question? Ted, Nancy? No. No, okay. All right. All right, now. On to the next Zoom. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.